Brett Kavanaugh and his wife Ashley spoke to Fox News tonight in an interview with Martha McCallum, but Brett Kavanaugh did not let his wife answer the single most important question that was addressed directly to his wife, as we'll show you in just a moment. The interview came after a very bad weekend for Brett Kavanaugh and the Republicans who are trying to make Brett Kavanaugh a Supreme Court justice. The Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, repeatedly embarrassed himself with his Republican Senate colleagues by issuing tough-sounding deadlines to lawyers representing Professor Christine Blasey Ford, who has accused Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault and attempted rape when they were in high school. And every time Dr. Ford and her, her lawyers ignored Chuck Grassley's deadline, Chuck Grassley then set a new deadline for Dr. Ford to decide if she would testify to the committee on Wednesday, a date and time set by Chuck Grassley. In the end, Dr. Ford agreed to testify but forced Chuck Grassley to delay the hearing until Thursday, which was one of Dr. Ford's original demands. While that deadline kept moving, Chuck Grassley's Judiciary Committee staff showed once again just how biased and unprofessional they are. On Saturday, Garrett Ventry was forced to resign from the committee staff when NBC News asked the committee about, quote, evidence he was fired from a previous political job in part because of a sexual harassment allegation against him. That was after the Republicans' chief counsel for confirmations tweeted last week that nothing Dr. Ford could say about Brett Kavanaugh would stop him from confirming Judge Kavanaugh. He wrote, unfazed and determined, we will confirm Judge Kavanaugh. The very bad weekend for Judge Kavanaugh ended late Sunday night with the senior Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, Dianne Feinstein tweeting, Thursday's hearing should be canceled in light of a disturbing new allegation of sexual misconduct against Brett Kavanaugh. The FBI must investigate all allegations. The new allegation that Senator Feinstein was referring to was reported in The New Yorker by Ronan Farrow and Jane Mayer. Deborah Ramirez told them that when she and Brett Kavanaugh were freshmen at Yale, she remembers that Kavanaugh exposed himself at a drunken dormitory party and thrust himself close to her face, so that when she pushed him away, she had to touch him in a way that horrified her. Full specific graphic details of that are included in the New Yorker article. And so, with the Kavanaugh nomination sinking fast by Sunday night, Donald Trump apparently decided that Monday morning was the day for a show of confidence by Republicans, even though Republicans are not confident that Brett Kavanaugh will be confirmed. There's a chance that this could be one of the single most unfair, unjust things to happen to a candidate for anything. But I am with Judge Kavanaugh, and I look forward to a vote. Donald Trump and all Republicans are always conveniently forgetting the historic unfairness that Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans delivered to Merrick Garland, Barack Obama's nominee for the Supreme Court, who was never even given a hearing. Republicans left that Supreme Court seat vacant for over a year. The mastermind of the Republicans' Merrick Garland strategy said this today. I want to make it perfectly clear, Mr. President, Judge Kavanaugh will be voted on here on the Senate floor, up or down, on the Senate floor. This fine nominee to the Supreme Court will receive a vote in this Senate in the near future. Voted on up or down. So maybe down, but voted on. That's actually a very big step back from what he said last week. Here's what I want to tell you. In the very near future, Judge Kavanaugh will be on the United States Supreme Court. So my friends, keep the faith. Don't get rattled by all of this. We're going to plow right through it and do our job. They are rattled. Make no mistake about it. They are trying to sound confident, but every day that passes is bringing new trouble for the Kavanaugh nomination, including what Michael Avenatti claims is more evidence that will come out within the next two days, evidence from a, a woman who Michael Avenatti is describing, as you heard uh, previously in this hour, as a witness and a victim, a victim of what could be uh, possible rape scenarios during what appears to be the high school years. Uh, we're going to wait for the details of that to come out, That then, as Michael Avenatti promises they will. If Republicans were actually confident 
They would not be sending Brett Kavanaugh out to do an interview on Fox News. Supreme Court nominees, nominees never do interviews during the confirmation process, never. Sending Brett Kavanaugh and his wife to Fox News was a desperate move by desperate people. And what we saw was Brett Kavanaugh at his most mechanical, in a thoroughly rehearsed performance, with none of the relaxed extemporaneous speaking that he did in his confirmation hearing when he was being questioned by friendly Republicans. It was a very different Brett Kavanaugh that we saw tonight. Brett Kavanaugh did about a 15-minute interview in which he only said a few things, very few things, but he said them over and over again. Here was talking point number one. No, I've never sexually assaulted anyone, not in high school, not ever. I've never sexually assaulted anyone in high school or otherwise. I've never sexually assaulted anyone in high school or otherwise. I've never sexually assaulted anyone in high school or at any time so when in she my said life. I've never sexually assaulted anyone. I've never sexually assaulted anyone. He was only asked that question once, but he kept using that answer as a way of not answering other questions. Here is Kavanaugh talking point number two. I am looking for a fair process, yeah. a process where I can defend my integrity and clear my name. And all I'm asking for is fairness and that I be heard in this process. All I'm asking for is a fair process. Again, again, just asking for a fair process. Again, I'm just asking for a fair process. I want a fair process where I can defend my integrity. I want a fair process. I just want a fair process. I just want a fair process. I just want an opportunity, a fair process. We're looking for a fair process. He was never actually asked if he wanted a fair process. That was just the language that he kept pumping in instead of answering some of the questions. And when Martha McCallum asked Brett Kavanaugh, why the fair process didn't include an FBI investigation. He simply refused to answer the question and replayed his talking points. Talk point number three was about those 65 women who miraculously produced a letter of support for Brett Kavanaugh as soon as the sexual assault allegation first became public. The 65 who overnight signed a letter from high school saying I always treated them with dignity and respect. 65 women who knew me in high school. 65 women. Okay, so much for the talking points. Now here, here's the most important moment in the Fox News interview with Brett Kavanaugh and his wife. It was when his wife, Ashley, was asked a question that the Kavanaugh talking points did not anticipate. The question was directed quite reasonably directly to Brett Kavanaugh's wife. And Brett Kavanaugh would not allow Ashley Kavanaugh to answer that question. Do you believe there should be an FBI investigation into these allegations and that a pause should happen and, you know, sort it all out? If there's nothing to worry about and nothing to hide, why not have that process, Ashley? And then I'll ask you that, Brett. I mean, I, you know, I've said all along, and Ashley too, I want to be heard. I want a fair process where I can defend my integrity and clear my name as quickly as I, as I can in whatever forum the Senate deems appropriate. I really wanted to hear Ashley Kavanaugh's answer to that question. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but Brett Kavanaugh wasn't going to let that happen. And then tonight, after that interview, the New York Times broke a new story about Brett Kavanaugh. And joining us now to report that story is New York Times reporter Kate Kelly, joining us by phone. Uh, and Kate, what are you reporting tonight in the New York Times? Uh, Lawrence, thanks for having me on to discuss this. Uh, we are reporting a story about the yearbook, the senior high school yearbook, uh, in which Brett Kavanaugh had a personal page and was in other photographs as did uh, good friends of his who were graduating at the same time. And the group of boys, it was an all-boys school, had a series of references to a young woman named Renata Schroeder, although they only referred to her by her first name, Renata. And they seemed innocuous but also coded. Renata alumni was something you would see a lot. It was on uh, Brett Kavanaugh's page, which said Renata alumnius, actually with a misspelling. Um, there was a group photograph that said Renata alumni, and there were other allusions to this Renata club, Renata alumni network. And the upshot of it is, Lawrence, that 
These were references to what we understand to have been an ongoing sort of banter among those boys at that time and overheard by other uh, boys at the school in their class and in other classes uh, that got around that they had had uh, physical contact, um, romantic type contact with this woman, Renata Schroeder, who was a friend of theirs and was in their social circle. But the reality was that there was no sexual contact uh, with any of them. And it was just a lot of braggadocio. And uh, it turns out uh, Renata is one of the names on that list of 65 who signed a letter of support for Brett Kavanaugh. She did that before she knew. She's only discovered through your reporting that this, that, that this theme exists within that yearbook. Isn't that correct? That's right. She did not know about the yearbook until recent days or, or the past week or so and was furious, quite frankly, when she heard about it uh, and, and disturbed and disappointed. Um, she gave us a strongly worded statement noting that this was news to her about the yearbook references and, and also the nature of the banter that took place at that time concerning her. Um, she said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said that she prays that these uh, men uh, never have their daughters talked about that way, and that the innuendo here is is very hurtful and painful. Um, she declined to discuss uh, directly how she felt about signing that letter or what she would do now. Uh, but the inference is clear, and and from what we understand, um, she's none too pleased with him and the situation. And uh, Kate, quickly before we go, I want to give some credit to some of the uh, the. The, the young, the, the now adult men who were boys Fellow at the time. Fellow graduates. Yeah, who, who, the boys in that school were not all uh, on board with this kind of uh, treatment of women, and some of them knew at the time that Renata was being uh, mistreated this way uh, verbally, and uh, they, they objected to it. They told you they objected to it at the time. That's right, uh, and, and we were fortunate to be able to speak to some of those um, schoolmates and classmates on the record about um, what they observed, uh, what they heard, uh, the, the nature of the behavior that they saw, um, and one of them, quite frankly, registered his complete disgust at the time and now, and this is someone who was described to us as a, as a friend of theirs, uh, at least back in the day. So that was, I think, courageous in this environment and, and interesting and helpful to hear. Um, I also got a very affecting email from one of the people we interviewed just saying uh, he was surprised and very disturbed by some of the allegations, not just the Renata material, but other allegations that have come up, uh, including, of course, those around Christine Blasey Ford, um, and really quite ashamed to know that this may have been happening at the time. Kate Kelly, thank you for your reporting. Thanks for joining us tonight. And when we come back...